program about national security, intelligence, and foreign policy. Today is Thursday, November 4th, 2021, and we are coming to you live from the studios of KMUD Community Radio in Northern California. I'm Mary Massey with my wonderful co-host, John Sakowitz. Good morning, John. Good morning, uh, Mary. Good morning, uh, KMUD audience uh, here in Northern California and throughout the world. I'd just like to uh, jump in with a quick... Uh, housekeeping item. It's not every day that Mendocino County appears on the front pages of the New York Times, but on Thursday, October, October 28, uh, 2021, a article by Thomas Fuller uh, entitled uh, School Faces Founder's Role in Native Killing talked about the role of um, Sir Serranus Hastings, um, the namesake for the Hastings Law School, and I believe the first Chief Justice of the uh, California Supreme Court his role in the uh, Native uh, Indian massacres um, uh, back when the uh, white settlers uh, first came to Northern California. I think it's required reading. Um, it brings us up to speed on um, the shameful history of, um, of how uh, POMOs were treated uh, by white settlers uh, here in Northern California. Again, it's on, on the front page of the Thursday, October 28th uh, uh, edition of the New York Times. Thank you, John. Today's show and all programs will be archived right here at KMUD.org and at our program website, heroespatriots.org. We invite you listeners to listen with questions for our guest today. That number, 707-923-3911. <clears throat> we will take as many uh, calls as time permits, and we ask that you be brief with your question. Our thanks to our wonderful French KMUD engineer Dorothy Sakur for assisting with the production of today's program. <clears throat> and I would like to say that views and opinions expressed during this program do not necessarily reflect those of the board, staff, or volunteers <clears throat> of KMUD Community Radio. John, I wanted to also say that uh, it's donation time. I made my pledge to, uh, not my pledge, my gift to KMUD. And I wanted to let listeners know that throughout the program, if they like what they're hearing, they can go to the website and donate by just using the link there at the website, or they can send in a check to P.O. Box 135-1144 Redway Drive, Redway 95560. Uh, we've had a home here for about two and a half years. And we've, and, and we've never been happier. We've never been happier. So I do want to mention that if you like what you're hearing on uh, KMUD, in particular, our show, Heroes and Patriots, which is heard the first and fifth Thursday of each month, please uh, become a member, maybe for the first time. It would be wonderful to have you. And and we bring you great guests. Mary and I do our best, along with the support uh, staff of uh, KMUD, uh, to bring you um, what we think is real uh, cutting-edge uh, programming and content uh, here at Public Radio. Um, last Last month, we brought you a FBI whistleblower and 2002 um, Thai person of the year, uh, Colleen Rowley, and um, and uh, former 12-year um, uh, Congresswoman Cynthia McKinney, uh, the first uh, black Congresswoman um, uh, to come from Georgia. Um, these are uh, A-list guests. Our guest today, Jefferson Morley, is an A-list guest, a <laughs> leading authority on the Kennedy assassination. Mary and I do our part. The KMUD staff does their part. The volunteers do their part. And now it's time to step up and become a member. Do your part. We thank you for your support. Absolutely, John. So in the last several months, John and I have featured guests who have taken a close look at our government and what possible role it has played in significant events throughout the, the years. We've examined the events prior to and after 9-11 and the anthrax incidents which followed. Today, we are examining another important event in the history of our country, that being the assassination of John F. Kennedy in 1963. And John, this year, it's 50, this month, it's 58 years since that. And the possible role of our government and or ally countries played a part in his murder. Recently, President Joe Biden and even former President Trump delayed the release of important documents and information until December 2022, citing the pandemic for the delay. Our guest this morning, Jefferson Morley, has investigated and written the events around the killing of the 35th president in his books. 
He is an investigative reporter and author in Washington, D.C., who has worked as an editor and writer for the Washington Post, Salon, the New Republican Arms Control Today, and Altern Alternet. <clears throat> and we're going to talk about this book specifically, Jefferson Morley's groundbreaking journalism about emerging new evidence in the assassination of Pre President John F. Kennedy is collected in the Kindle ebook, which I have and I encourage everyone to look at. It's called CIA and JFK, The Last Assassination Secrets. We now welcome first time guest, Jefferson Morley to the program. Jeff? Hi, thanks for having me, Mary. Thanks for having me, John. And, and we should address you as Jefferson or Jeff or how? Jeff is fine. Jeff, Jeff is, is fine. fine, okay. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, just real quickly, could you react to the, again, delay by President Biden to the release of information? I know your book is a couple of years old now, but um, President Trump delayed it. And now Biden has delayed it with the idea that the pandemic has somehow thwarted its release. Yeah, uh, it, it's, a, it's an old excuse. The COVID dog ate my homework. Um, <laughs> look, the CIA and the FBI uh, have had four years to prepare for the release, which is mandatory under the JFK Records Act of 1992. Um, President Trump acquiesced to pressure from the CIA and FBI in 2017 and delayed the release of some 15,000 documents that contain redactions. That was the first delay. Right. And the second delay came last month when President Biden said uh, that there, no documents would be released. Um, I should say, President Biden said, ordered the agencies to produce whatever documents they could by December 15th this year. And if they uh -huh. wanted to keep postponing the release of documents, they could do that until December 15th, 2022. So we right. may see some documents next month. Um, but the point being... If these agencies have blown two deadlines and feel no compunction about obeying the law, the JFK Records Act of 1992, it would be foolish to believe that they're not going to continue to delay. When I spoke to the Washington Post about this, I said, I think it's a ruse. And it may not be. They may actually be trying to come to terms with what they're going to do with the problem that they have on their hands. And so we might see significant revelations. I think the record of the past is, is not encouraging towards that. It is possible. Right. So, right. Go ahead. Jeff, let's, let's go into your uh, thoughts as to why there's been a delay. Um, talk about the link between the CIA, the uh, Kennedy assassination, uh, the CIA link uh, to uh, Cuba, and um, and what followed in the investigation into the investi uh, into the assassination itself? The CIA is all over the place. It's, please explain yeah. that yeah. to our so, listeners. I mean, it's, there's a couple of things that are important to understand as kind of background of this story. One is how has the CIA responded in the past to requests for information about its role in the events that led to the assassination of the president? And for 58 years. The pattern is quite consistent. Deception, deceit, and delay. That was true from the first day of the assassination when the CIA told the FBI, we don't know anything about this fellow named Oswald who's been arrested. We only had a few, we had five records in our files about him. Okay? That was a lie. They had about 45 records in their files about him. Deputy Director CIA Richard Helms testified to, this, to the Warren Commission under oath and was asked, how much information do you have about this fellow, Oswald, before the assassination? And he said it was, quote, minimal, quote, unquote. That was a lie. They had quite extensive information about Oswald, about his personal life. They were reading his mail, politics, his left-wing views, his foreign travels, his presumed contacts with Soviet and Cuban intelligence agents in Mexico City. So, the Warren Commission lied, I mean, the CIA lied from the start about what they knew about Oswald. And that's what's happening today. And this is their problem. Why are they delaying? Why are they hiding things? The most logical conclusion is they're hiding things because they have something significant to hide. And I think that the 
the refusal to obey the law the second time around is a clear indication of that. They have something very significant to hide. And so they have a big problem. And their solution to the problem is what the solution they've had for the past 58 years. We're just going to delay a little bit more, and we're not really going to tell you the truth, because if they told the truth, it would reflect very badly on the CIA, and that might affect the CIA's budget in 2021. People ask me a lot of times, like, Jeff, why, you know, it's so, it happened so long ago. What, you know, why everybody's dead? Why, you know, why hide it? And the reason is that it would have contemporary political implications. If the CIA came clean on JFK, that might threaten the CIA's budget next year. And no agency wants its budget threatened. No agency wants to look bad in the eyes of the public. So that's what's going on here. That's why they're, um, you know, delaying and, and still covering up. Yeah, and it's important to note, and, and we've had um, guys like uh, Ray McGovern on our show, um, a 28-year veteran of the CIA, who presented the CIA's daily White House briefing to, to three presidents. Mm -hmm. um, very credible guy. Uh, tell us that really it really is all about the money and not just the CIA's budget, but he went on to say that 70% of all intelligence uh, is outsourced to private contractors. So it's a lot of money. So p please uh, just uh, say a few words about the kind of money we're talking about, Jeff. Well, the CIA is a $15 billion a year agency, um, uh, as, as far as we know. That's, that, that figure is a couple years old, but it's probably around that size. So, you know, if, it came, it, if the documents come out showing that the CIA manipulated Lee Harvey Oswald, which is what I think they're hiding, um, you know, Congress would say, well, you're not going to get as much money next year. So there's a lot of money at stake. And, right. um, and, you know, there's also, you know, if you've been hiding this and it came out, well, people are going to say, well, who was responsible? <laughs> Current right. officials at the CIA today are looking at the records we can't look at, and they understand they have a problem. When it comes out, those people are going to be held responsible. And the people who held the job 10 years ago and the people who held the job 20 years ago, this, is, this thing has been going on for generations. So right. a lot of CIA officials would be implicated if there was full disclosure. So it's not just a matter of ancient history. It's a matter of current bureaucratic politics. And, and we know who the point man uh, for who, respons who was responsible is. Um, CIA counterintelligence uh, uh, chief James uh, Jesus uh, Angelton. Uh, Angelton. In his, right. Yeah, in his, so, testimony, in his um, testimony to the church committee, I mean, he made no secret about it. He made no bones about it, no apologies when he said it's inconceivable that a secret intelligence arm of the government, like the CIA, has to comply with all the overt orders of the government. He was crystal clear. The, yeah, the Kennedy that, assassination, the, the Kennedy government does not tell us what attitude. to do. That's the attitude that they have. I, I wrote my biography of Angleton, The Ghost, which I published in 2017, makes clear that this cover-up of the lies to the Warren Commission were designed to protect Angleton because it was Angleton's people who controlled the file on Lee Harvey Oswald, right? The file that the CIA said did not exist. When, 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 the, when the CIA told the FBI right after President Kennedy was ki had been killed, we don't know anything about this guy, that was a lie because Angleton's people held the file and they knew quite a bit. So, Angleton is the focal point historically for the JFK cover-up. And we have that in writing. Um, in March 1964, uh, the Warren Commission learned, hey, the CIA didn't have five documents on this guy, Oswald. They had 45 documents on this guy. They've been watching him closely, constantly, since November 5, 1959. So the Warren Commission asked for these records that the CIA had not shared in the first 10 weeks after President Kennedy had been killed. They realized, oh, God, the CIA knows a whole lot. Can we see those records? And Angleton writes a memo back to his boss, Richard Helms, and he says, um, I would rather wait out the commission. Okay? Why would a senior CIA official want to wait out a commission investigating the assassination of a president? 
Well, right. if you knew a whole lot about Lee Harvey Oswald and didn't want to talk about to, that to the public, because that might change the investigation or people might investigate the CIA itself, that explains it. That's, that's the explanation. And that's where this pattern of deception, deceit, and delay originates with James Angleton in March 1964. But it's important to understand that has been the consistent policy to this day. And we see last month, they again prevailed on President Biden, the CIA prevailed on President Biden, just as they prevailed on President Trump. No, we, we don't want to release this stuff. Don't make us release it. And the right. president said, okay, you, you know, we'll give you another pass. That's where we stand today. It's 15 minutes past the hour. We are speaking with Jefferson Morley on uh, the assassination of JFK and his book, CIA and JFK, The Last Assassination Secrets is a very interesting book, and you're very clear up front to say this is not a book about conspiracy theories. And your first, um, I guess, chapter, if you will, you say there are three known facts that, that you have, and then there are many things that we don't know. Could you describe what we do know, those three known facts? Well, what have we learned in recent years? The journalistic approach is what do we know now that we didn't know then? Okay, what has emerged since the 1990s, since Oliver Stone's movie, JFK? Mm -hmm. So one thing that we've learned is there was a secret Pentagon plan to provoke a war with Cuba by, um, it was called Operation North Woods, and we have a couple hundred pages of documents about Operation North Woods. And the plan was we would... The Pentagon wanted to overthrow the government of Cuba. How could we do that quickly and efficiently? And so they came up with Operation North Woods. And the plan was this. Stage a spectacular crime on the United States and create the circumstances by which that crime would be blamed on Cuba. Hmm. And this was the plan of the Pentagon. And the planners went through, well, how could we do this? Well, we could fake an airline hijacking. That was one. We could fake a terror attack in Miami or Washington. We could fake an attack on Cuban refugees at sea. They said real or imagined. So they were contemplating massacring people who were fleeing the government of Cuba, blaming it on Cuba, and then using that as justification for a U.S. invasion with the idea that this would establish Cuba was an outlaw regime, a threat to international peace, and the president could order the invasion. Okay. That was, that's not a conspiracy theory. That was the policy of the Joint Chiefs of Staff adopted in May 1963. No investigators of the assassination ever knew about that plan. Because imagine if we had known about that plan. What happened right. on November 22nd, 1963? Somebody staged a spectacular attack on a U.S. target, the president, and CIA assets immediately set out to blame Cuba for the crime. So Operation North Woods becomes a kind of template. I'm not, I'm not saying that that's exactly what happened, but it surely right. should be investigated. Um, that was one thing. A second thing that we have learned since, uh, in, since the 1990s is, I've alluded to this, just how extensive the CIA's pre-assassination knowledge of Oswald was. When, when the CIA was called in and asked to explain, they lied. Richard Helms lied to the Warren Commission and said we had only minimal information about Oswald. That was false. They knew quite a bit about quite a bit about him, which raises the possibility, especially in the context of the North Woods revelations, well, maybe they were manipulating him to blame a great crime on Cuba. So right. that's a second fact that that it, that we have learned in recent years. Um, I don't have CIA and JFK at hand. What was the third thing that I alluded to? In, in well, the you, you said that no one has been held accountable. No one has been fired. Uh, well, right. No one has this is, been this put is, in jail. Yeah. So, um, I mean, think about it. The president of the United States was shot dead in broad daylight, and no one was ever brought to justice for the crime. That's one point. A second point is no one so much has lost their job, Right. No one in James Angleton's offices lost their job because they'd been watching the man who killed the president for four years and didn't do anything. Let's assume the official, the official theory is true. Oswald acted alone. 
well, what about all these people who've been watching you for four years? What did they think? What, they didn't do their job. Somebody should have lost their job. Right. Nobody lost their job, which is a good sign that the fix was in, that nobody could talk about this, and everybody was just going to say a story that you, you hear today. A little right. man killed a big man, get over it. You know, move right. along. There's nothing to see here. Well, now we know that's simply false. Multiple right. CIA lies um, and a whole lot more information that demands explanation and is not explained by the official theory that this guy killed the president for no reason and somebody came along and killed him for no reason. It, right. it, doesn't, it does not explain the available record. And to complete the historical record, which is all we're asking, right, we just want full disclosure as mandated by Congress. You know, right. They don't want to do that because what that would show would be highly embarrassing to them. And my understanding from your book, if maybe I have this information incorrect, but um, the fact that the CIA had these documents on Oswald, but and were be, and he was being surveilled before the the shooting. Um, the, the local police and FBI and so forth were not aware of this uh, this fact, and so therefore, you know, they weren't yeah. they weren't aware well, that this is a possibility. This man Oswald is going to kill him. Absolutely. Um, one one important thing to remember is when the president travels overseas, or when presidents traveled overseas in that period. The counterintelligence staff, headed by James Angleton, worked in collaboration with the Secret Service to identify threats. So when President Eisenhower, President Kennedy traveled, somebody from the counterintelligence staff would travel with the Secret Service agents to identify threats and to develop a security plan accordingly. Okay? The counterintelligence staff was the entity in the U.S. government which knew the most about Lee Harvey Oswald by far. By far, nobody else had all the information that Angleton's people had. And yet, in 1963, even after Oswald had been arrested, even after he had been in contact with presumed Soviet and Cuban intelligence agents in Mexico City, the counterintelligence staff passed nothing to the Secret Service. So right. Oswald had this protected status before the assassination, and the CIA is protecting what it knew 58 years later. Wow. Jeff, uh, the CIA uh, had a real presence in Dallas on the day of the assassination. Uh, you had um, you had three, uh, quote unquote, tramps, hobos who were arrested um, near the Texas School Board Depository building. Uh, and then later, um, just as mysteriously as they were picked up, they were released. They were later identified as E. Howard Hunt. Uh, oh. He was one of the three tramps, um, and we know what his uh, role was in the uh, Watergate uh, break-in. Uh, the second one was Frank Sturgis. Uh, uh, I want you to talk about Ian Howard Hunt and Frank Sturgis. And then the third uh, tramp was, uh, alleged tramp, was Dan Carswell, another CIA agent who was uh, in Dealey Plaza. Uh, it's also been suggested that uh, George H.W. Bush, who later went on to become um, the director of the CIA, was in Dallas on the day of the uh, assassination. So talk about you, Howard Hunt, Frank Sturgis, and Don, Dan Carswell, and um, why do you think they were posing as tramps? Why do you think they were in Dallas? Uh, what are some of your thoughts? Uh, I don't think that picture shows E. Howard Hunt, Frank Sturgis, or Dan Carswell. Um, in 1992, the Dallas Police Department released the records of the three tramps who were, who, were, who were identified. We got their names, and indeed, they were homeless men who were arrested and released. That story is simply, I don't believe that story is true. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, so, uh, but the CIA did have a presence in Dallas, um, which they did not disclose to the Warren Commission. Uh, there's a, an office in the CIA called the Domestic Contacts Division. And the Domestic Contacts Division, uh, the head of that office was a former FBI agent named Jim Moore. And Jim Moore knew that Oswald was in Dallas. So the CIA was watching Oswald even when he was in Dallas. Um, the, the story about the three tramps, 
you know, it's based on this photo identification, which is extremely weak. You know, it's, it's a very weak form. It's easy to make mistakes. There is no definitive confirmation that those people, that that's Hunt, Sturgis, and, 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 and anybody else. They were truly tramps. My, my analysis of the, the assassination does not rely on that information at all. My, right. my analysis of the assassination is based on the documented fact of all these senior officials who knew who Oswald were and the intention to create a pretext for a war, an invasion of Cuba. That's where I think the analysis goes. Where, what are they hiding? What are the records that are being hidden? We know a lot about these records, and it's very clear to see what they're hiding. One category of information is people like Jim Moore, CIA officials who knew about Oswald before the assassination. Their files are redacted. There's a man named Jim Moore. There's a man named Birch O'Neill, a woman named Ann Goodpaster. These were people who we know had knowledge of Oswald before the assassination. Their files are still redacted. Um, the assassination plots against Fidel Castro. These, there's, there's, there's several files in, in, that are still being held that related to that, and they are heavily redacted. Uh, another category of information that's being withheld, the surveillance techniques that were used to detect Oswald's presence in Mexico City, 58 years old. Those are still being redacted. So these right. are the hot spots. These are the things that they don't want to talk about. This is why they're delaying, because as you get closer to the story, you begin to see, wow, there were a lot of, not just CIA officials, there were a lot of operations officers, people whose job it was to mount secret operations and to mount black operations. A black operation is where you blame the enemy for your own actions, which Operation right. North Woods was a black operation. So... That's the context that we see. There's a plan to, to provoke a war with Cuba. There's a lot of people who know about the man who supposedly killed the president and denied that he killed the president. Um, and you have a whole body of secret records. So that's the story now. There, there's no right. theory to this. There is a body of records. There's a, a, an incomplete picture of the CIA's role in the events that lead to the assassination. And what we see very clearly is the CIA does not want to fill out that picture. What, it, what, is, what is being withheld now is we, we're getting a more complete picture of the events that led to the assassination and the CIA's role in those events, but now we see the pieces of the picture that are missing. And so right. what we're looking for in, in these last these JFK records is let's fill in the pieces of this mosaic and see what the big picture really is. And that's what they don't want to do. That's what they can't afford to do. It's 28 minutes past the hour. We're going to take a brief uh, pause. And remember, uh, listeners, if you would like to speak with our guest today at, after the break, 707-923-3911 with your question where you're talking about the CIA and JFK, the last assassination secrets. And uh, Jeff, I want to ask you, I've, I've worked uh, with the intelligence community uh, for quite some time, um, and, it, uh, you know, I know what it, it involved to get a security clearance, uh, the, the background checks, um, uh, everything about my background, um, right. the, the polygraphs. Um, I mean, I can go on and on. Uh, it took the better part of a year to get a security clearance. Um, and, and yet when I look at a guy like uh, James uh, uh, Angleton, I say to myself, how did he ever become chief of counterintelligence? He uh, shared intelligence with Soviet spy Kim Fibley, he, uh, 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 Philby. He was a member, uh, was a member of the uh, notorious Cambridge spy ring. Um, uh, Angleton launched uh, unilaterally mass surveillance by opening the mail of hundreds of thousands of Americans. He abetted a scheme to aid Israel's uh, nuclear de uh, development efforts, disregarding uh, uh, his president, John Kennedy, and U.S. security. He committed perjury. He obstructed um, the JFK assassination investigation. He oversaw a massive spying operation on the anti-war movement, on black nationalists, on, uh, on uh, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. He initiated an obsessive search for communist moles that nearly destroyed the agency and much of the government. How did a guy like that get to be chief of counterintelligence? 
He was extremely smart. He was intellectually charismatic, and his actions were entirely approved by the CIA leadership at the time. All of the things that you were talking about caused him to lose his job when they were exposed to the public, but they were not controversial within the CIA. To the contrary, Angleton was thought to be, at the time that he did all those things, he had the authority of the institution to do them. So Mm -hmm. looking back on it, you can say, you know, it was folly, and it was, but that's why he was able to do those things. There there was no public knowledge of... um, of all of those things at the time he was doing. So there was no pressure against him to not do them. To the contrary, everybody who mattered inside the CIA approved of what he was doing. And, I might add, after the assassination of President Kennedy, they never looked into what exactly he was doing with Oswald. That's why the assassination was never truly investigated, because it never went to the part of the CIA that knew the most about Oswald. So that begs the question, what is the culture uh, uh, inside the CIA like? What was it like then, and has it changed now? Is it still the same culture? Um, Well, this was the culture of the Cold War. We were were in an existential fight to the death with a nuclear-armed superpower that was intent on dominating us, so anything we did in in response was okay um, because we're— you know, justice is on our side. So they had, a, you know, a license to kill, and that lasted for 25 years. When the workings of the CIA, the assassination plots, the knowledge of Oswald, the lies about JFK were exposed in the mid-1970s, the CIA had its first come up in, um, with the investigation of the Church Committee. For the first time, the CIA was held accountable for some things, Angleton was fired and, 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 and lost his job. The CIA's budget was cut. Um, their, their covert operations were cut back. So it was when these things were exposed that the CIA was, began to be held accountable a little bit. Is it still the, the culture today? Yeah. I mean, the CIA morphed seamlessly from the existential enemy of the Soviet Union to the existential threat of uh, jihadist terrorism. In, in starting in the 1990s and after 9-11. And now we're pivoting again to great power competition with the Soviet Union and China, but the rationalization for the CIA remains the same. It has a blank check, a license to kill, and it will be spared from accountability to the public. So I don't think the mentality has changed that much, um, maybe a little. Um, yeah. You know, the CIA is a big institution. There's a diversity of opinion within it. Um, uh, so, but that's why, uh, and that mentality prevails. And that's what we saw last month. You know, they don't want to talk about this. The law says they have to talk about it. Their response is we don't have to obey the law. And they got president Biden and president Trump to go along with that. Jefferson Morley, we have a phone caller, uh, uh, for you, a caller, if you're listening, go ahead with your question. Hi, Mr. Morley. Um, I'm curious if, if you if you have um, uh, had any uh, opportunity to pursue um, some of the other things that were going on within uh, the CIA, um, you know, for example, in the in the fifties and the sixties, the so-called Operation Mockingbird. Now, um, obviously, assassination is a, a kind of a dire management tool, but I'm I'm wondering if you have looked at or seen any linkages or use of that particular uh, tool in how man how how the journalist contacts were uh, managed over the years and, and I'm thinking specifically of a couple of cases uh, we had the case of uh, Ruben Salazar in uh, Los Angeles in 1970 and uh, the whole brown beret movement uh, the Chicano student movement um, and I'm just curious if if that's been explored. Yeah, it has. I mean, it hasn't been a a focus of my work, but, um, you know, clearly relevant. Starting in the 1950s, the CIA set out to cultivate contacts in the journalistic community. Um, The best thing that was ever written about this was um, Carl Bernstein in Rolling Stone in, in 1977, who did a lot of reporting. And, you know, several dozen... U.S. journalists were regarded within the CIA as assets. 
who would who could be relied on to put out the agency's line, you know, when they wanted it to be put out. So they have maintained that. Um, I mean, I, I don't know if it's still called Operation Mockingbird, but they still cultivate the press um, and uh, uh, reporters who are willing to favor the CIA narrative will get favorable treatment in, in terms of, you know, inside information and that sort of thing. And that's an important part of how the JFK story has been managed. You know, four years after the assassination in 1967, Deputy Director Richard Helms sent a memo to all CIA stations, not all CIA stations, but all the important CIA stations in the world about critics of the Warren Commission. And they realized then, as they realize now, they have this big problem that people simply don't believe them. You know, Mm -hmm. their story is not credible with most people. And I might add, it wasn't credible with Lyndon Johnson or Jackie Kennedy or Bobby Kennedy. Um, It wasn't credible with a lot of people. And so how do you how do you deal with that? Well, the memo outlined the strategy for managing the press. And the idea of conspiracy theorists, quote unquote, is a key concept that is articulated in this memo. And, and, And the concept goes like this. We cooperated with the Warren Commission in every possible way, um, and the members of the Warren Commission were men of integrity. And so criticism of the Warren Commission is really criticism of the U.S. government and a favor to foreign powers. So that was, that was one argument. People who criticize the Warren Commission are, you know, they're helping the enemy. They're helping the opposition. That, that was one thing. The second thing was, um, you know, they're, they are theorists. They're not dealing in facts, um, which is simply not true. There's the official theory, and then there's alternative theories. We know the official theory is not particularly credible. It's not supported by the facts at a lot of key points. So managing the press becomes more important. And this memo, countering critics of the Warren Commission from 1967, outlines the strategy that, um, that the CIA had. It's worth noting in this context that within the CIA itself, that story is no longer credible either. And in 2013, the CIA put out an open source article acknowledging that the CIA did not cooperate with the Warren Commission, that their cooperation Mm. was passive, um, uh, incomplete, and that the story of the, the theory of the lone gunman was a convenient truth. It was not an established truth. So even within right. the CIA, people understand the weakness of the theory. And so that's what they're managing now is we don't have a credible story. We face pressure for full disclosure. What do we do? Well, what you do is you delay. And that's, that's what we're seeing right now. It's 40 minutes past the hour. Jefferson, we have another phone caller uh, for you. Okay. Uh, caller, go ahead with your question. Yes, thanks for taking my call. I heard uh, many, many years ago that uh, all the facts in regards to the JFK assassination would be revealed, something like the idea of 50 years after Caroline Kennedy's death or something to that, something like that. Do you know anything Mm -hmm. about that? And thanks very much. Yeah, so two things. One, the the JFK Records Act passed in 1992 said all government records related to the assassination should be made public in 25 years. So that was 1992. 25 years later was 2017. I think that what the caller is referring to on Caroline Kennedy is a couple of, one very key document is a series of interviews that Jackie Kennedy did with journalist William Manchester in the spring of 1964. He was the only journalist who, who Jackie ever spoke to um, because he was a longtime friend of hers. Um, the transcripts of those conversations, um, according to a deed of gift um, uh, uh, from Manchester, will not be made public until 2039, 75 years after they were um, after the, 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 the interview took place. And so that's the information that is still withheld. And, we, and we, we probably won't see those interviews recently. But that's one reason why that material, which is controlled by Caroline Kennedy, is not, you know, will not come out this year because the deed of gift extends the secrecy around those interviews until 2039. 
Right. We, uh, Jefferson, we've done a couple shows on perhaps why the president was assassinated. And shortly after he remarked that he would not be a part of a shadow government, dark government, government that hides uh, secrets from the people, he was killed shortly after that. And in your book, you talk about the role of extreme secrecy in a democratic society. Could you say more about that? Well, I mean, you know, this is a classic example of, you know, there couldn't be any more serious event than the murder of an elected sitting president. And the fact that, you know, 58 years later, we don't have all the facts, you know, our democracy has been compromised. The people don't have the information that they deserve by law um, because these secret agencies retain this power within the democratic, larger democratic structure of our government. And so, you know, we have this compromise. And, and I think that, you know, the fact that the CIA was not held accountable in 1964, that there was no real investigation of the CIA's roles in the event, if there had been, the power of the CIA would have been circumscribed after that. And it, the Kennedy assassination is really a turning point where the secret agencies have impunity. And that impunity lasted, you know, through the 1970s, the investigation of Watergate and the Church Committee curbed the CIA to a certain extent. A lot, a lot was revealed, and people said, "No, that's not acceptable. We don't want that. We're going to, we're going to get this agency under control." But that impunity, you know, has extended, and we saw it in the Iran Contra scandal. Um, we saw it in the imposition of a, terror, a torture regime after 9/11, of a mass mm-hmm. surveillance regime after 9/11. So CIA impunity has survived these scandals and is still, you know, a big factor in limiting the, the, the role of the people in the, in the governance of the country. The secret agency has its own empire, which the civilian government, the elected government, simply has no control over. And that's really the importance of how can they blow a deadline written into law, approved by Congress unanimously, How can they blow a deadline twice? Because they have impunity. That's the the answer. There is no other answer. That's a description of what is going on. They have impunity, and they still have impunity over the JFK story. Yeah, Jeff, uh, what uh, Mary was specifically uh, referring to was the speech that uh, President Kennedy made uh, to the National Association of Newspaper Publishers uh, in April of the year he was assassinated at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel, in which he explicitly warns of a shadow government, explicitly warns of secret societies like the one um, uh, yeah. Angleton yeah, headed no, up. And, 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 and President Kennedy was, was, you know, was trying to get this message across to the public. I'm not saying that that speech is why he was assassinated. I think no, that no, the no. assassination was actually the work of a very small group motivated by fear of Kennedy's policies around Cuba. Um, That's based on the evidence we have. That's the most likely explanation. I think. And and there were some other, I mean, he was making uh, enemies left and right. Uh, So, uh, you know, there was, uh, there was the whole withdrawal of the uh, air and uh, support for the Bay of Pigs. uh, But also, the cover up of the CIA's relationship with also the uh, cover up of uh, Oswald in a, an, a, an agent and of his trip to Mexico was uh, Kennedy reining in the power of the Federal Reserve System. Kennedy wanted to go back to linking the dollar to a fungible um, commodity like silver. Uh, that made huge enemies for Kennedy. And there was uh, Kennedy wanted to withdraw American adv- military advisors in Vietnam. That was another group of enemies he made. Uh, Kennedy uh, also uh, w- wanted Israel to rein in its uh, nuclear weapons development program. And there exists in uh, the Kennedy Library, and I've seen it myself, uh, letters to um, the then uh, Israeli prime minister warning that America would not support that program. In fact, yeah, you know, with Kennedy was Kennedy was trying to to steer the ship of state in a new direction, and contrary to what people think, it, it's actually not that easy for the president to do that. But 
Kennedy was taking small steps, especially in 1963, after the scare of the Cuban Missile Crisis, when he confronted the fact that he was, he was close to having to order a nuclear attack for really no reason that involved the security of the United States. You know, Cuba was not an important country strategically to the United States. It doesn't, it's not important economically. It's not important militarily. And yet we were about to go to war over it, about to go to nuclear war. So in 1963, Kennedy dials down his Cuba policy. He pursues a limited test ban treaty with the Soviet Union, something that the generals and the Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, opposed. It was clear he was not going to authorize an invasion of Cuba. And so, you know, there was deep concern in the national security community that Kennedy was straying from the essential foundation of U.S. policy of, of anti-communism. And he was. You know, he wanted, he wanted to wind down the Cold War. The generals wanted to wind it up. And so um, he had a lot of enemies with his, within his own government. I also think it's important to note that Kennedy came out for the Civil Rights Bill for the first time in June 1963. He'd been dragging his feet for two years. It, just, it wasn't an important issue to him. But with the assassination of Medgar Evers, he finally came out in favor of the Voting Rights Act um, or the Civil Rights Act in, in the fall of 1963. And if you understand the culture of law enforcement agencies, you know that was anathema to the FBI. That was anathema to the to the Dallas police. Both institutions thoroughly racist. And so Kennedy's policies also meant that he did not have protection of law enforcement. He did not have the loyalty of law enforcement because he had come out in favor of the Civil Rights Act. And that was a factor in the assassination, too, in the carelessness of the security procedures that were followed in Dallas. I agree. I agree completely. Um, uh, speak, uh, if you will, about um, Wynne Scott, the former CIA station chief in Mexico City. How does he fit into this uh, very complicated well, puzzle? Well, my first book, Our Man in Mexico, um, is a biography of, of Winston Scott. Winston Scott was the chief of CIA station in Mexico City from 1956 to 1969, 13 years. And he was a very powerful figure. He was really the second most powerful man in Mexico. He had, three, he had a dozen top Mexican officials on the CIA payroll under a program called Lee Tempo. And he uh, had a front row seat on Oswald's visit to Mexico City in September 1963, seven weeks before the assassination. Wynne Scott did not believe the official story of the assassination. And that was really something that I discovered while I was writing my book. When he retired in 1969, Scott wrote a memoir uh, uh, of his career in the CIA. And in the, in, the, in the memoir, he writes a chapter about Oswald. And he said something very important. He said that the CIA had lied to the Warren Commission. And he quotes the Warren Commission. And one of the things that the Warren Commission was told by the CIA was, we knew so little about this fellow Oswald that we never knew he had been in touch with the Cubans in Mexico City. Okay? That was a bald-faced lie. And Wynne Scott knew that it was a lie because he was the guy who had Oswald under surveillance. He had a very elaborate surveillance mechanism around the Cuban and Soviet embassies in Mexico City. He knew everything about anybody who went in and out of those buildings. And so when he read in the Warren Commission, we didn't know that Oswald was in contact with Cubans. He wrote, absolutely we knew, and we knew everything about him. And what Wynne Scott was saying was, some other people in the CIA may have some explaining to do about this Oswald guy, but I don't, and I'm not going to be the fall guy. That's why he wrote the memo the memoir. And in there, he said he did not believe the official theory, and he thought the president had been killed by a conspiracy. So, Wynne Scott was a super CIA insider, um, 13 years as a station chief in a very important city as a sign. He won the agency's highest medal after he retired, the Distinguished Intelligence Medal, and he knew more about Oswald in Mexico City than anybody else. And he didn't believe the official story. So, was Wynne Scott part of an assassination conspiracy? No, I don't think so. I think he realized there had been a conspiracy, and he was not going to take the blame for it. Um, right. And that's he why he wrote his memoir. Right. He was a very and credible. He was, a, he, was another, he was very. He was a very credible critic of the cover story. Absolutely. When he died, 
James Angleton flew to Mexico City and seized the memoir, and the CIA suppressed it for the next 25 years. Wow. Wow. So who who that, was that, that, that's that's how that's how they that's how attentive they are to controlling the story and who, and who can comment on it. So wow. imagine if, if it had become public in 1975 or 1971. You know, the CIA station chief in Mexico City said the CIA lied to the Warren Commission. That was a bombshell story. Well, they controlled it by suppressing it. So that's what they do. You know, they control the story by suppressing key points of information. So I'm still heartbroken over my president's assassination. I was an 11-year-old boy when um, Kennedy was assassinated, and he was my president. Uh, mm -hmm. I can remember it was the first political campaign I worked on. I loved John Kennedy. I loved yeah. the Kennedy family. Um, I, I'm, I was heartbroken when John Kennedy Jr. died, and I think there is a lot of that's a suspicious uh, and uh, an explicable death in and of itself. And I love Carolyn Kennedy. I'm a New Yorker. Uh -huh. I love this family, and I think that there it's it's not just a great tragedy, but it's compounded by the fact that the, our shadow government continues to cover it up. So my question to you in our final couple of minutes here, Jeff, is um, can lawsuits crack uh, the, 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 the case of the murder of John Kennedy? Uh, can technology crack the case? How can we get to the truth? Um, I think there's... We need action on a bunch of fronts. We need to keep the issue alive in court, and um, a group of lawyers have sued uh, uh, the National Archives for communications between the CIA and the president about these records. Why are they being suppressed? Why is the delay being released? So that's one front. We, we, need, we need full disclosure around the process as well as around the records. Um, I think that we do have new technology. We have the Internet. And the record of the assassination is going to be available to anybody, not just to people in Washington, not just to high officials. One good piece of news that, that was contained in the president's letter of, of October 22nd was the National Archives is going to digitize the entire JFK collection, several million pages of records. Wow. And when that happens, anybody in the world will be able to have access to these records. Now, in the long run, I believe that will make a difference because the control of the story will be taken out of the agencies and should be out there in civil society where people can make sense of it and add it up without having a political take or a bureaucratic take that protects somebody's interests but it's really more, what does the full historical record tell us? So Jefferson, we have about three minutes left, and I wondered if you might sure. direct folks to your writings, your work, and how they might learn more about you personally, but also the other work that you've been doing. So um, one place to go is my blog, jfkfacts.org, J-F-K-F-A-C-T-S dot O-R-G, um, this is a, a website where I just post new information about the Kennedy assassination. There's no theories. If you, have a, if you want a JFK theory, don't come to my site. If you want to know <laughs> what the real historical record says, visit JFK Facts. You can buy my books at jeffersonmorleybooks.com, Our Man in Mexico about Winston Scott, uh, The Ghost about James Angleton. And um, I have a book coming out next year which also has some information about the JFK assassination called Scorpion's Dance, and it's the story of the CIA and Watergate, but there is a JFK subtext in that. Scorpion's Dance will be published by St. Martin's Press next June. So if you want to know more about the real historical record of the assassination, I would recommend reading my three books um, okay. or visiting my site, jfkfacts.org. Uh, Jeff, I was wondering if you could get a copy of that book to the station so that Mary and I might read it. And then uh, as you come up on the uh, book's release, we'll have you back and uh, you can talk about the book. Yes, I will. I, I will definitely do that. Um, the book provides some real context about how hiding the truth about the Kennedy assassination factored into the politics of the 60s and 1970s, and even factored into the Watergate scandal itself. Um, right. Well, Jefferson Marley, we are delighted that you were with us this first time, and we appreciate it so very, very much, and we will be back in touch and, and look for your updates. Thank you for being with us today. 
You were a great well, guest, thank, Jeff. Thank you. Th thank you very much for having me and, and, and for taking the time. It's a real pleasure to talk about these things thoughtfully and not just in, you know, uh, little sound bites and cliches. So thank right. you for this chance. You bet. Jefferson Morley is an investigative reporter and author in Washington, D.C., who has worked as an editor and writer for The Washington Post, Salon, The New Republic, Arms Control Today, and Alternate. We've been speaking about his Kindle ebook, CIA and JFK, The Last Assassination Secret.